Hello, and welcome to episode two of Live from the Archive from WCF Symphony. My name is Jason Weinberger, and I am Pauline Barrett, Artistic Director of the Orchestra, welcoming you again into my home. As we say, still distance for the most part, and uh, of course the symphony is working on some actual concerts that we can put together for you here sometime over the next couple of months as conditions allow. But in the meantime, we are continuing our look at some of the more memorable performances that the orchestra has given over the last 10 or so years. Uh, today's program is a bit of a journey, and hopefully that's nice for all of us who are kind of stuck close to home. We are going to be traveling to Vienna, and not just Vienna of today, but this incredibly rich and exciting time in Vienna from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, just after the death of Mozart, when other composers like Haydn and Beethoven and Schubert himself were active as performers and composers in this amazing musical city. And this trip to Vienna is going to take a closer look at one of the most interesting pieces in the classical repertoire, Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. Um, this is a piece which we know so well, it's so famous, and yet even if you know it well, I hope that today's program will give you something new to think about with respect to this piece. Because really it is a story that hasn't fully resolved itself and we don't know all the facts about Schubert's unfinished symphony, this B minor symphony that comes down to us only in a partial form. Uh, but we know enough about it to be able to take a closer look at the work and its circumstances and even to make some conjecture about what Schubert might have intended with this really remarkable piece of music. Now, one of the most amazing things about this work, which as I mentioned, after 200 years is one of the most famous pieces in the repertoire, is that none of it was performed during Schubert's lifetime. In fact, this work was only heard for the first time 37 years after Schubert died. It's really remarkable when you think about any work of art having its premiere a full generation after the life of its creator. Um, that certainly would give us a different perspective on any work of art. And that seems to have set this unique trajectory in motion with Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. So what we're gonna do here, just a few words about the piece, but also in listening to it, is to try and get a glimpse of this work and of Vienna at the beginning of the 19th century through Schubert's eyes, or as you'll see here on our video cast, his glasses. And in fact, these are Schubert's actual glasses and you can see them uh, if you visit the Schubert birth house in Vienna, which is a wonderful place to visit. Um, really great place to get a feel for where Schubert is from. And of course, you can see his glasses uh, that we're showing up here on the screen right now, a famous artifact from Schubert's life. So the program uh, that we're gonna present for you here features the two uh, famous finished movements of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, the first and second movements, which have come down to us complete, or at least um, complete in terms of, you know, written out end to end. We don't really know about any revisions um, that Schubert may have wanted to do. Uh, then we're also going to perform for you a set of pieces that are more conjectural, but are linked with this particular work. And so sort of a sort of a two part program here, hearing the Schubert's Unfinished that um, you all know and then hearing some music related to this symphony um, and some conjectural music uh, to help us get a better understanding for Schubert and this whole piece. Now, as we get started, I think it would be good for us to get to know some of the protagonists in this interesting story. Of course, we're gonna be talking a lot about Franz Schubert himself, very interesting composer, um, had a big presence in Vienna, and yet, as we see through the Unfinished Symphony, um, was someone who could write a major work that wasn't even performed during his lifetime. Um, and this may not have been totally remarkable. So Schubert, even though he is quite famous today, um, he wasn't necessarily the most prosperous and famous composer in Vienna during his lifetime, but certainly well known and a good uh, network of musical friends. And one of those friends was a gentleman named Anselm Hudenbrunner. And um, this character, uh, seems to have been friendly with Schubert in Vienna. Um, Schubert knew his brother as well. And in fact, in 1823, Schubert sent the score of the Unfinished Symphony with 
uh, Anselm Huttenbrunner's brother to Graz, another city in Austria where Huttenbrunner was living. And the score remained there in Huttenbrunner's possession for uh, almost 40 years until it was discovered by another musician. Uh, and his name is Johann von Herbeck, a conductor, a sort of a, a Brooklynite hipster, I guess, uh, if you were to judge him by today's standards. But uh, I guess all of us conductors are hipsters in one way or the other. Uh, this guy, though, uh, caught wind of the fact that there was an unknown manuscript by Schubert in Huttenbrunner's house, and he managed to get a hold of it and arranged for the first performance of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony to take place in 1865. Um, so really just remarkable, the story of how this piece even got to an audience to begin with. Um, thereafter, um, the work, of course, became much more well-known in its two-movement form, and that's what we're going to start with here in this presentation. Uh, then over the um, 150 years since this premiere, uh, there have been some different approaches to how to finish this piece. And we'll be doing that later in the program as well. So stylistically, this is such a unique piece. It warrants a little bit of commentary. Um, it, it, it seems to be um, a, a mark for Schubert in a changing style from his earlier symphonies which even though influenced by Beethoven and his contemporaries, also seemed to have a heavy dose of Mozart and Haydn, uh, Schubert's predecessors. Uh, then here with this work, we see him sort of turn direction a little bit. And the piece really begins with an incredibly striking gesture. And you'll see it in the manuscript score that we have of this movement, um, very spare, uh, just a single line in the bass voices and the strings, the cellos and basses. Um, and this is what that sounds like. Just a remarkable way to open a symphony and unlike anything that had been heard at least up until the 18 teens, possibly even until 1865 when the piece was premiered. Um, and, and this opening later becomes a, a hallmark of the development of this work as, as Schubert develops the themes. Uh, we'll hear this theme come back at significant moments. Um, it seems actually as Schubert develops this work that he's um, taking uh, what seems to be a very simple but plaintive and stark theme um, and subjecting it to some contrasts and some developments with other music that um, leads him on a path of echoing um, a whole range of composers. We hear, we hear Beethoven very much in this, but also uh, Mozart, particularly the late Mozart. Uh, then we also hear echoes of the Baroque, especially in the development section of this first movement. Uh, it seems that Schubert is kind of casting his musical ear across music history, trying to reckon with it and come to terms with it in this amazing movement, this first movement of the Unfinished Symphony. Um, and then um, we have the first sort of proper theme, and uh, it's worth mentioning because it often elicits some giggles among the younger set in the audience, since it was used in the popular cartoon, uh, The Smurfs, to represent the evil character, Gargamel. And from our original performance, our principal oboist um, shared with us her version of this theme, um, you'll hear Heather play this uh, as she did in our demonstration at the concert, this um, kind of uh, inversion in a way, uh, a sort of a, a counterpoint to that opening theme you heard in the cellos and basses. And Heather sounds wonderful as always, uh, particularly in that uh, sort of lyrical um, legato theme that Schubert creates here. And um, uh, it's nice to hear it with fresh ears from one of our players and we kind of dissociate it um, from all the commercials and cartoons and movies uh, that have used this music and try and kind of return back to the voice of Schubert uh, here in this period of time in the early part of the 19th century. Um, then uh, the work develops into a, a, another theme, uh, sort of the second theme proper, but really in a way the third theme that Schubert introduces. And that we will not uh, preview for you right now, 
but is a wonderful taste of Austria during Schubert's lifetime. It really is like a gentle version of a beer drinking tune. Uh, this sort of Austrian folk music, uh, we call it the Landler, is, is really this um, sort of rural dance uh, uh, that was very much part of classical music in the, starting in the late 18th century into the 19th century in Vienna. Uh, and this is as Viennese as it gets. So in terms of your uh, imaginary trip out of the country to Vienna, um, this will satisfy that, hopefully, that theme uh, that you hear a couple of times in the first movement. So um, that kind of gives you, gives you some background on the first movement. The second movement is an andante con moto, um, 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 an andante with motion. We've tried to uh, give an interpretation of this piece that really um, uh, sort of like a song, and Schubert was, was famous for writing songs. Uh, for piano and voice, and this has a flavor of that, particularly with some of the more melodic elements, and also has some very striking, very spare, almost minimal moments. And um, we could guess that perhaps Schubert might have revised this, but also, as I said earlier, I think we can maybe correctly surmise that Schubert was really pushing the limits of instrumental texture in this piece, and, and who knows what direction the symphony would have taken if we had a completed third and fourth movements, but we do know um, that the first and second movements you're going to hear right now are in fact complete and really give us an interesting picture of Schubert the composer at this period of time in his life and at this period of time in musical history in Vienna. Later in the program we'll look at uh, sort of the second half of this piece and I'll rejoin you for some comments about that and uh, then we'll maybe learn a little bit more about what we don't know regarding this particular symphony. So with a little bit of background, we hope you enjoy here the first two movements of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony from our performance of it in March of 2015.
absolutely amazing music by Franz Schubert, performed beautifully by the musicians of WCF Symphony. I think the orchestra just captured Schubert's style so wonderfully in this performance from 2015. And at most orchestra performances, if you went to hear the Schubert Unfinished Symphony, that would be it. Uh, but of course, you know that our concerts are not typical concerts and often feature some special explorations of the music we perform. And that was certainly the case with this performance. So we're going to continue on with our look at Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, uh, looking a bit more at what we don't know about the piece and trying to gain an appreciation for that. Um, now, uh, the next thing we're going to play for you is the third movement of the Unfinished Symphony. I know you're sitting there at home looking at me going, this guy's crazy. There is no third movement of Schubert's Unfinished. Uh, well, actually, the um, manuscript score that Schubert had sent to Hüttenbrunner that was only discovered in the 1860s, that score includes two pages of a third movement fully complete for orchestra. Uh, and then the rest is torn out. So we don't actually know what Schubert finished. Um, we, we really um, are, are kind of looking into an abyss here. Uh, but it's but it's there and it's completed and we'll we'll get into that um, in just a little bit. Uh, but before we do, um, let's back up all the way to this period of time, the first part of the 19th century in Vienna, and get a feel for Schubert and his friend Hüttenbrunner and their circle of musicians. As I mentioned earlier, Schubert was uh, well regarded by musicians and, and serious music listeners in Vienna at this time, but he was not a um, pan-European, very famous composer in the, in the way that um, Mozart or even Mendelssohn uh, were. Schubert instead was kind of a local composer, and it shows in his music with this strong Viennese flavor, but I also think it demonstrates a lot about his daily life. Um, he certainly didn't travel a ton. Uh, but instead spent most of the time hanging out in the city with his friends. Um, here's a picture of him together with Hüttenbrunner and another one of their friends from this period. And um, they, were, um, they were known to go to the tavern. And in fact, Schubert uh, is rumored to have written quite a bit of music at the tavern. And uh, that's something that we're going to uh, uh, flow right into the next movement because Schubert's music does have this kind of earthy quality. And much of it seems to reflect, um, you know, sort of the everyday environment, the tavern or, you know, the stream outside the city. These are these are images in Schubert's music that um, seem to come directly out of his surroundings. Uh, and that certainly seems to be the case with this third movement from Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. Um, this uh, this piece, of course, um, is known to us in the manuscript. Um, but at the end of that section of music, we look at these two pages of the scherzo, and the first of those pages is on the screen for you to take a look at. And we just consider what might have been here. Um, in the end, I think we can assume there was quite a bit there. In fact, the assumption is that Schubert probably finished this movement, and there are a couple reasons why that may be the case. Uh, one, when we look at this opening, it's totally finished. Um, and, and, and really, it gives you a sense for exactly what Schubert probably wanted it to sound like. Um, in fact, this is what the music sounds like that is on this manuscript before um, this last page is torn out or is missing. Um, this is what Schubert's music in the third movement sounds like. So we have these two pages of music by Schubert, and it sounds incredibly finished. And then after Schubert's death among his papers, uh, there was a piano score of this entire movement that was discovered uh, with his other things. And it, it turns out it's almost complete as a phrase at the end that's missing. Uh, but with this piano score in hand, and, and, and this type of piano score is something that many 19th century composers would have used as they were drafting a piece of music, then orchestrating it for full orchestra. Um, because we have all this musical material, we know what the melodies were meant to be and kind of the structure of the movement. And then, uh, of course, we have the orchestrated uh, beginning uh, leads us to believe that Schubert probably finished this movement. But of course, 
we don't know what exactly it sounded like. And there's actually been sort of a cottage industry over the last 150 years in in the um, the art of finishing Schubert's music. And it's not just the Unfinished Symphony, but other works uh, have have had attempted completions done to them. Kind of a, an odd musical fetish. But in this case, it's really worth doing because we know so much about what Schubert put into this movement. We're just not totally sure how he finished it. So there are a number of completions of this scherzo. And we think the most interesting is by a British scholar named Brian Newbold. And Newbold has worked uh, quite a bit on Schubert's music throughout his career. Uh, and this, I think, is sort of his crowning achievement in terms of his contribution to the Schubert scholarship. He doesn't suggest that this is meant to be Schubert. He suggests that this is an idea of what Schubert may have done. But we find so much of the character of the composer in this music that we had to include it. And in particular, this music uh, seems to come straight out of these Viennese taverns. It's so lively. It's almost like beer drinking music. You can see, you know, uh, just an, uh, a rough and, and tumble scene. Um, it's wonderful, lively music that transitions in the middle, the, the middle section, the trio, which is very typical of a third movement to have that contrasting section. Um, this trio is a much more pastoral kind of vibe, almost almost could be uh, a couple of little kids out, you know, singing their favorite Viennese song um, out on a, on a hike or a, a, a play date outside the city. Um, these are, are scenes that, of course, are sort of idyllic in our minds, but, but I feel like we can, we can hear the spirit of uh, more of the popular music of, its of this time coming through in, uh, in Schubert's third movement. And in fact, Schubert uh, was also a composer of German dances and just in general seemed to have his finger on the pulse of popular musical style. And that is something that shines through in this wonderful completion of the scherzo movement of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. <laughs>
What an incredible movement of Schubert's music as completed by scholar Brian Newbold. That is the third movement of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. And you might be thinking at this point, we've exhausted all of our avenues of inquiry for this piece. Not quite yet, uh, but before we go on with the last selection we have to offer you on this special broadcast, we'd like to invite you to support the symphony using uh, the donate link that you can find uh, down below in the caption or visiting our Facebook page or our website. Um, we have some wonderful things planned for next year, but we're also trying to be as fiscally responsible as we can in this very unpredictable time. And so we appreciate any support that you can provide that will help us ensure that WCF Symphony continues to present really intriguing programs of orchestral music like this long into the future. Thank you so much for considering that. Now we will go on with Schubert in a moment. I do want to say that we've got some wonderful Live from the Archive programs coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And several of them are going to be looking at the issue of diversity in classical music, which as many of you I'm sure know, has become an issue in larger society um, in an acute way here in the last couple of weeks. And so we would like to contribute to that um, conversation and that thought process. And we have some programming that we think will be beneficial to the conversation. So look forward to that here over the next couple of weeks. We're very excited to continue this series as the summer goes on. Now, getting back to Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, we don't know much more about the piece than what I've already told you, but given that Schubert obviously devoted a tremendous amount of imagination and effort to two full movements, probably a third full movement, although we don't know for sure, um, it seems inconceivable that he hadn't thought about a finale for this piece. Um, it's possible he didn't write it. And of course, we learn with Schubert that often his life circumstances sort of took his music in these directions, uh, didn't, didn't always have the ideal working conditions. But I think we can assume Schubert at least had an idea of a finale. And if he did, it would have been something probably 8, 10, 12 minutes long, scored for the same orchestra that you have heard in this program so far, including the trumpets and trombones and timpani, as well as the regular wind and string sections. Um, and uh, would have been in B minor, because that is the home key of the symphony, and typically the finale will return back to the home key of the symphony, following the pattern of all the other movements that Schubert wrote for this piece. Uh, but of course, we don't know because the manuscript was torn out. However, just after sending the manuscript off to Hüttenbrunner, Schubert began working on a new piece. He was working on several pieces, actually. The Wanderer fantasy comes from this period of time, but he began also working on another piece uh, called Rosamund. He was writing incidental music to a theatrical presentation of this play. And it really, um, it really is striking to see that in the entract for the first act of this incidental music, we have a large scale movement about 10 minutes long for the same orchestra as was used in the Unfinished Symphony uh, in B minor. And this movement really does conform to the proportions and the style of a symphonic finale. So we really don't know if Schubert actually wrote any of this music while he was writing the Unfinished Symphony. Maybe he had some of these ideas sketched and he came back to them for Rosamund. If he hadn't finished the, uh, the Unfinished uh, Symphony to begin with, uh, maybe he repurposed some of the ideas after he sent the score to Hüttenbrunner. We don't know, but we do know that this piece can provide a fitting finale to our listening experience. And there's another set of reasons we wanted to include this piece. We think it gives the final, um, the final perspective on Schubert to allow you uh, as full as possible a view of this individual. Someone we've talked about as being very interested in music history, um, very well respected as a composer, but also just a really down to earth human being. Um, somebody who enjoyed the tavern, um, you know, had a, had a pretty robust group of friends. Uh, we hear that in his music as well. Uh, and this piece and sort of the circumstances at the end of Schubert's life also um, sort of lend us a view of, of sort of the tragic element uh, in Schubert's story, which is, of course, that he didn't even make it to be as old as Mozart. He died at the age of 31. Uh, he had contracted syphilis, uh, suffered from that, and then he may have uh, died because of it or because of a treatment that he received for the syphilis. We're not sure. Um, in any case, uh, at his funeral, um, the Requiem music was provided by Anselm Hüttenbrunner. And that sort of 
brings this whole story uh, full circle in a way, maybe an incomplete circle, maybe a circle that's always got an opening and we're, we're always trying to find a way to close it. Uh, but I hope that, that the story of these individuals and the story of this piece gives you an appreciation for this really remarkable life that Schubert lived, um, the life of a practicing musician, um, writing a symphony he never finished, sending the score off to his friend, and it was never performed during his lifetime, turning around just after that and writing a finale for incidental music for a play uh, that seems like it, it may be related to the symphony. Um, all of these elements of Schubert's life really um, stack up to give us a picture of who he was as an individual, as a composer, and also help us understand um, where this unfinished symphony fits. It's such an iconic work. It can overshadow much of Schubert's other output. And of course, it can also um, kind of lead us into a twisted view of his life. And so by including all four of these movements together, we hope you, we give you a bigger picture of who Schubert was. I also find this last movement to be really exciting and fun. This incidental music to Rosamund is wonderful stuff that I first encountered in high school and uh, always wanted to perform some more of it. And this concert in 2015 was the first opportunity to get back to this wonderful music of Schubert. One last note about the performance. We used a smaller orchestra and uh, the brass players used some modifications to their instruments so that we could really try to capture this, this sort of late classical sound. And Schubert sits kind of on the end of the classical period, right at the horizon of the romantic period. Uh, but we wanted to recapture that, that sound, a more transparent and direct sound of the orchestra of his time. And uh, I think that serves all of this music very well. I think the orchestra just did a tremendous job. Um, so hopefully when this movement is done and you're all um, getting ready to move on with your evenings, you'll give a nice at home round of applause for our wonderful musicians. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to our staff, uh, always does a great job and working very hard right now to develop some planning for you to enjoy some live events in the near future. Until then, enjoy this last movement of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony and join us again for more live from the archive upcoming here in just a couple of weeks. Thanks and see you soon.